Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the first Maker Ed session on the Intel Galileo. And we are in spirit wearing the, the Galileo glasses. I'm Steve Davey, the Director of Education and Communications here at Maker Ed. And I'm joined with a whole bunch of Maker Core mentors that work at a couple of institutions. I'll let, them, I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll start right into it, talking about Galileo. So BK, why don't you start? Um, share where you're from, how you're involved with Maker Ed, and, and uh, your inst various institutions and roles that you play. Cool. Uh, so, hey everybody, I'm BK. Uh, I work at the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, and I'm part of the Maker John initiative. It's a thing that started actually last summer as part of Maker Core, and we're doing Maker Core again this summer as well. Um, there, I guess I do a bunch of stuff. Right now, I'm working on like, design workshops with teens to make digital badges, but we also work in a bunch of different uh, library locations, about nine right now, uh, doing like Maker activities with teens, but then also uh, middle schoolers and younger. So I help our mentors uh, come up with projects to work on. If they have questions about things, I'm there for them for that, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, um, including being part of the um, Maker Ed Ex Galileo Explorer project, which mm -hmm. supports your institution in Houston's and others um, to kind of quite figure out how to use these and share the resources in an educational context. Yep. And that's, that's totally what I've been interested in, is taking stuff like the Makey Makey, or also this now, the Galileo, um, and figuring out what are the ways that we can introduce kids to them um, and have them learning on them and then creating things with them. That's, that's really what I've been kind of focused on for about a year now, I guess, since the fall. Fantastic. All right. Gentlemen in Houston, can you introduce yourselves? Okay. Oh, Hi. Uh, Hi, guys. Uh, we're from the Children's Museum in Houston. If you hear a little bit of noise in the background, we're about to do demo hours as well. So sorry about that. Um, but basically, we are working in the Maker NX, which is a new exhibit we're really excited about uh, at the museum. And it's a workshop. Some of the tools behind you can see behind me. And we're basically trying to show uh, the museum patrons, particularly children, um, how to use the tools available to us in this workshop and get them really interested in do-it-yourself projects. And so over the course of the summer, we've been developing uh, workshops that we have every single day. Um, made basically, like a musical theremin is what we are, excuse me, a uh, photo theremin. Um, we've been doing a Makey Makey controllers. A lot of people mentioned in other projects, other workshops that we've been working on. Oh, workshops. So, so we've been, uh, let's see, another one that we did, we did some woodworking. With the kids, uh, we've done some Arduino with the summer camp that comes by. Yeah. So it's a little bit different from a traditional makerspace because in a makerspace, you usually have members that have memberships. And they come over, uh, do their thing, develop their projects. Over here, it's, uh, we cater to just whoever swings by the museum. Uh, so we grab them for about an hour or so, do an activity with them. Uh, but then we also document. Uh, a bunch of other projects that they can do and uh, they can do, uh, in their own. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. And um, thanks for muting, by the way, when you're not speaking <laughs> for the background. Mm -hmm. So what's your elevator pitch for the Galileo? If somebody asks you what it is, or what are the, the, the fewest words possible? How, how is it that you explain to people what, what, big, what the big deal is with words like this? How would you guys describe to, say, an educator who, does, who has maybe a little bit of Arduino experience, but no, nothing more than that? So usually when we're trying to explain what the Galileo is, we try to relate it as much as maybe Arduino as we can. Uh, just saying it's a beefed up version of it with more capability. Uh, and for those people that don't know what an Arduino is, we then go into discussion about what a microcontroller is and how we utilize that here in our space for the different projects we implement. Cool. BK, do you have an elevator pitch of any kind? Yeah, I guess usually like when I have stuff around me, let me pull this stuff up. Like when I have a normal Arduino and maybe some shields of the stuff that you can use to plug things in and have like little inputs and then outputs and stuff like that. I say that the Galileo uh, just simply is like an Arduino but with all the extra stuff that allows you to connect it to the internet and things like that. So it's just an Arduino with all the extra stuff. It's, it's my, my one liner. Um, I got a technical issue here. I'm going to try to take care of it. I'm unable to sticky click any of the screens here, so I need to figure out why that is, and see if I can fix it real quick. OK. 
occasionally Google. Sorry about that. All right, that's not going to work. All right, apologies. Um, yeah, so far on this broadcast, the only large screen people have seen in this Hangout is, is BK, your face. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Amazing, everybody gets to see me. Hilarious. So now that you know that, <laughs> you better be attentive because for whatever reason, I am not able to sticky click screens. Uh, they're not shifting between windows and the broadcast. Um, we'll fight through this a little bit longer and see if that happens, but otherwise, we'll, we'll, go, with, we'll go forward a little bit. Um, we may actually abandon if that doesn't work because it's going to get real distracting really quickly. So I do want to share um, my thoughts about the Arduino. When I, when I watched this Make video that was the, the first sessions, uh, one of the things I noticed right off the bat was, even though I understood the jargon, um, it was extremely jargon heavy and, and um, not necessarily very friendly to folks who are really curious about the possibility and potential of the board education-wise, um, which is fine. I want to kind of go in and, and explain without the jargon what it is about the, Ar the Galileo and other boards like it um, that's different from, from the... Uh, from the Arduino as a comparison, as a baseline. So, but again, without the full screen thing, we're having some problems here. Um, let's see if this works. Is this showing up full screen for you guys, this little diagram that I made here? Yes, it is. OK, great. Um, so I was looking at one thing, just starting with a quick search on Amazon and the cost of things. Um, the base price of Amazon right now for the Galileo is $60. Um, to add the Wi-Fi capability, I found PC cards anywhere in the $10 to $20 range. A very easy way to add Wi-Fi capability to the Galileo. The Arduino, base price $23. To get Wi-Fi capability, it's actually one of the more expensive shields around. Um, so $80, but you might... You may be able to get it 60 or, or far cheaper than that, but that's the price that was on Amazon at the moment. To get an SD card, secure digital card for various reasons, uh, $10 for another shield on the Uno. To get Ethernet capability, which will be important about what we talk about, uh, $10, $20 or so. To get a real-time clock, if that's important for your project, 16 So very quickly it adds up uh, to quite a bit more than the base price of the Galileo for what it comes standard with. The main comparison, though, that's interesting that may not have relevance, as much relevance as it seems, but could have a lot of relevance, is the difference in relative computational power. And I'll say power rather than speed. Uh, the Galileo has got far more memory, 256 megabytes, for example, versus a built-in 32 kilobytes for the Arduino, but that can be expanded. We've got 400 megahertz versus 16 megahertz, we have 32-bit versus 8-bit. This means, in relative terms, computer-wise, that we're talking about the difference in computational power between 1998-era iMac or 1988-era Mac SE, actually. So a little, little close. It's, it's a, not an apples and apples comparison. Um, and also, there's a difference in speed versus computation. But, uh, but that means that the Galileo is a lot for the money in terms of potential and possibility, which is part of the reason we're having this conversation here. So with that said, do you guys have anything to add about this sort of comparison? Granted. Don't take any of these prices literally. They change all the time. And we know that I'm making some comparisons in computation that aren't fair between different historical computers and the Galileo and the Arduino. Any thoughts on that? It looks like you're still on me on the, the feed. Yeah. Your diagram. Um. Yeah, the, st the sticky clicking is it's still not working at all. Um, let's take a look and see if we have any questions here. You know what we might do is restart this. I might get out and come back and see if that s solves the problem. So okay. forgive me for disappearing. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. I'm back. Hi. I may edit this, so this is the actual new beginning to the broadcast because we've had some technical difficulties. So if that's the case, welcome. 
<laughs> we're talking about the Intel Galileo, and I would love to have thoughts uh, from our participants here on. I just covered the uh, the cost differences for relative different aspects of the boards and what they might be useful for. So, what do you guys think about that comparison? Is it a fair one, or is it one that's uh, useful in terms of showing the board's potential? So, um, I wanted to add that it is good to compare it to the Uno because it is, after all, an Arduino. But it might also be good to compare it to uh, the other boards that can have Linux capabilities, such as the Raspa, um, and see what the difference between those two are. Absolutely. And I think that's um, the Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, all the um, other variations that Brandon's showing right now. <laughs> you got the full collection there. That's great. <laughs> So I think that's been covered a lot, the difference between these boards. But what's the uh, the primary difference between a Galileo, for example, and those other boards that you're talking about, the other Linux boards? And and can you explain for the viewers out there that might not know what a Linux board is, why that's important, and how that might be useful to them, even if they're not Linux experts? OK. Well, um, basically, the Galileo is pretty much more of a Linux board, but it has a Arduino emulation that happens within its system. So um, it kind of allows people that have more of a Linux background to uh, directly control uh, the pins uh, to Linux if they want. But it also allows the people that are more familiar with the Arduino IDE to directly program it with the IDE. So um, it kind of caters to those two different audiences, um, which is kind of what makes the Galileo unique, useful. If you're, you know, if you're coming from the Arduino and you want to get into Linux, it's really great for that. And if you come from a computer background and you want to do more physical computing, it's also really useful. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Linux is an operating system, uh, much sort of like Windows, uh, more along the lines of DOS, if anybody remembers that from the 80s and early 90s. Uh, very simple to use, standardized, also free. This allows you to interface with programs that already exist. And definitely some, a good skill to have is, be, is to be familiar with Linux. Uh, the other, another thing that I just thought about is that, as you said, uh, if you go from an Arduino and you get a Wi-Fi shield, it's very pricey. Uh, but when it comes to, to the Galileo board, uh, can't really see it. Uh, the the fact that it has a PCI Express uh, port and also a USB uh, port allows you to pretty much hook up anything that you can find a driver for, yeah. and that's a really long list of stuff. Yeah. I, mean, I guess given that Linux is widely used, a lot of people have written drivers for uh, a lot of common hardware that you might want to interface with your Galileo. Webcams, Wi-Fi cards, any pretty much any device. That's great. I think I've solved our clicking problem here. Um, but the translation of what you guys just said a little bit, even down to easier terms, is that people that know Linux really well can write chunks of code or libraries of code that allow you to use a webcam, that allow you to do things to get stuff from Twitter, for example, to um, to be able to kind of, in a modular sense, be able to use the power of the board, even if you don't know <laughs> raw Linux programming. Much like you don't need to know a huge amount of coding for Arduino, you can use libraries, chunks of things that they are able to do things. Um, so that's the kind of the growing power of these boards: is that the more is developed for them, the more it allows you to use more powerful tools and instruments, like USB audio or webcam, things like that. So. I'd love to hear some about the uh, projects that you've been working on in particular. Sure. Um, we've had quite a few projects here. One of them is, if you check on our website, kidmakers.org, is a sundial uh, or sun emulator. We've built a large device that has 12, 12 positions where lights, uh, light is emitted from. And this will allow children to put their sundial under and test it. And to drive this device, we've used a Galileo. Um, pretty simplistic, just you press a button, goes through the different lights. Another example of a project we have, as you mentioned, Steve, is using shields. And Rahul here has been trying to decipher 
how to use the Adafruit Motor Shield with the Galileo because currently there is no support. Oh boy! Wow. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, as uh, John mentioned, I've been trying to use that Adafruit Motor Shield because it's a it's a very popular shield uh, with like Arduino users um, to control uh, motors, stepper motors. It's just because there's a library that exists for it, and it's really, really versatile. Uh, unfortunately, if you try to copy and paste like your Adafruit Motor Shield code uh, into your Galileo IDE, nothing's going to happen. And so, what I since I wasn't super familiar with how the actual board itself worked, I took the chips. Uh, oh, thanks. I took the chips off of the board, um, and I've been like lo looking at pinouts and uh, circuit diagrams to try to figure out how these components relate to one another. And so in a post on KidMakers, um, I try to break that down for the users. But basically, it uses a shift register, um, which will require a lengthy explanation if you are not familiar with the component. There's an amazing tutorial on uh, bildr.org, but uh, it's, it uses a shift register um, coupled with two half-H bridge drivers. Um, and so based on uh, those three chips together, we can get outputs. Uh, you can see the lights uh, over here, outputs from that shift register uh, controlled by this Galileo. And so what these lights are are the different outputs uh, from the shift register, which can be used to control uh, um, motors. And so uh, if I lit up LED, is it clear in there? I can't really tell what I'm seeing. Just yeah, yeah, I'm seeing the board. Awesome. So, like, for example, if I lit up uh, LED number uh, three or something, I could turn on uh, this motor here, and like, I can turn. If I turn on LED, excuse me, I said three, I think, and then if I turn on LED four, I can make this motor go the opposite direction. Um, and so that's like the basics of getting the Adafruit motor shield working. Um, and then I guess with further further experimentation, um, I can get more complex. Uh, functions going, though some assistance with constructing a library for it would be. Wow. Awesome. I mean, at the moment, that looks incredibly complex uh, compared to a plug-and-play, put it on your Arduino and um, and make the motors go kind of thing. Um, are you suggesting or saying that the, with the right software that you can completely do away with what you've had to put together there with the shift register? Absolutely. So what I am simulating Sitting here um, with through a bunch of jumper wires is what is already on the Adafruit motor shield, and so by mapping the pins from the Adafruit motor shield to the pins on the Galileo, um, and converting whatever bare bones code I've already written to control motors, um, you can just go ahead, plug in your Adafruit motor shield, um, write specific pins for the motors to be high or low, and you have basic directional mo motor control. We don't have speed control yet. Uh, I'm still working through that, but like if you're just trying to get some motors to turn on and off in, and go multiple directions, then we're good to go. Wow. Well, and all the code we've created will be available online on our website. Thank you. You want to share that website right now? Just a, is it? Sure. The yeah. website is kidmakers.org, and, and if you give me a second, I will have a screen share. Uh, Steve, if you want to continue on, you can go ahead. Okay, yeah. Let me, let me go over to BK and have you share a little bit about your projects, BK. Sure thing. So right now, what I've been working on, and I, this is just kind of like my little breadboard. It's probably a little harder to see. Um, same similar thing with some LEDs. Um, is a second iteration of a project that we did last summer called Connected Messages, which was um, murals that were made out of copper tape and LED circuits um, at each site that we were working at. So we were working at five sites. And... Um, what would happen is kids could decorate their own little panels of each each mural um, and then put them together. And as a collective whole, they were all uploaded and digitized to a website where you could actually send messages to the board and you could also store um, the story that was connected to each image. Um, so with the Galileo, since we have a few of them at the library in different locations, um, my focus has been on finding um, accessible ways for them to just be plugged in and then coded to. Um, for our kids, which our kids range from anywhere from six years old to 22 years old. They're not, not really kids anymore then, but they're, they're, they're working with us um, after school and during the summer. And I found a few different um, 
methods of, of uh, coding to the Galileo. One, which I, I'm never able to pronounce, is like a Willow, Willio Drin. Um, it's a website where you install, um, or you just copy it to the, the micro SD chip, um, a, a installation of Linux that's specific to the website. And then you're actually able to go online and send code directly to the Galileo. Um, and what I really like about it um, uh, is that the developer of this website um, is working on something similar to Scratch. And Scratch is another website where you have, if you don't already know it, um, building blocks, so almost like little Legos that you can kind of snap together. So it's like, if, if this happens, then do this thing. Um, and being able to do that with the Galileo to me is what is totally going to make it super accessible to our kids. And uh, going further, I'm hoping to, to utilize that um, as much as possible. Um, it's still in development, so it's kind of finicky and not working too well, but it's, it's um, the fact that we can play with it and we already kind of know what the, the circuits look like. Um, that's at least my next step and our next step um, in the Connected Messages project. The other thing we're doing is just documenting um, our mentors' first experiences with the Galileo, and that's something um, that will be on makerjohn.org soon. Uh, we have a resources tab, so if you go to makerjohn, M-A-K-E-R-J-A-W-N.org, um, there's a resources tab there where you can uh, check out the different projects we're working on, and we'll have a sub-blog for the Galileo project, which okay. is going to be out by the end of the week, so you see that and there. For viewers that are seeing this later on, I would uh, ask if you guys don't mind to put your um, links that you share, the kidmakers.org and the makerjohn.org, if you put them in the comments of the YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. That's appreciated. So, looks like we have the Kid Makers um, site up on the other site right now, so you can see it. Okay, guys, your screen share is up. All right, cool. Uh, so, yeah, here's our website, uh, kidmakers.org. Any projects, workshops that we do uh, will be hosted on this website. And like I mentioned before, we will post code or anything we find, as uh, BK mentioned earlier, the way he does it. So here we can see a few of our posts that we've made. Uh, one of our workshops is building a box, uh, CNC machines, 3D objects, uh, specifically for Galileo. Wow, that's super cool. I believe cool. under projects is the Galileo, uh, if it decides to behave. <laughs> let's see, I don't know if mine's published yet, but let's see. Well, I have mine. Yeah, this one. Play it? So you can see uh, the egg bot right there, which uh, Juan designed and built, and he'll talk about that right now. Okay. So this is a um, egg bot, also known as Pure Bot, and um, I just kind of created a platform um, for people to experiment with basic CNC machines. Um, so it does fit an Arduino Uno, but also the holes in the electronic bay. Uh, do accommodate a Galileo. Um, I haven't gotten it to work with the Galileo myself, but uh, at some point I would like to stick a Galileo in there and use its uh, Wi-Fi capabilities uh, and make it more of a web-enabled sphere bot. Um, another project that we've been working on, if you want to go back to Kid Makers. Sure. All right, so we'll go back to the projects. Uh, I took a, a, one of the top view photos of the Galileo and uh, generated a 3D model of it, um, which we'll try. So somewhere on our website, uh, currently don't know, but there is a 3D model of the Galileo oh. that uh, anybody is free to use on their CAD project. So if you want a model of the Galileo in your design on SolidWorks, Inventor, anything like that, you can come to our website, download the model, and use it in your design. There it is, right there on the right. All right, so um, I will say it's not 100% dimensionally accurate, but it's as accurate as I can make it by using calipers. Um, and then it does have um, it does have the pin locations um, and also the hole locations as well as anything that, pretty much anything that you would need to plug something into, such as the Ethernet or the power or any of the pins. Uh, it also has a PCI Express uh, 
uh, a connector at the bottom. So hopefully this will allow people to you know design the packaging around their Galileo projects. That's super cool. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that you know all that you're seeing as viewers right now is incredibly large amounts of work to do this, but it's all for the good of other people. I think that's what's remarkable about a tool like the Galileo is that as you develop pieces for yourself and projects for yourself and, and getting around its initial limitations and challenges since it's brand new or relatively new still, um, we're building a library of objects and code and ways of using it that'll make this easier and easier to use as time goes on. And it's because of people like we're seeing here that that even happens. It's how the Arduino community exploded. So with this next generation of boards that have huge amounts of capability, um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge everybody that shares their files and sources, things like that, absolutely free. It's a remarkable community. So what this means to you as an educator, if you're interested in the use of this board, is that your students can very quickly become vastly more experienced in this sort of thing, uh, both because of what they can develop on their own if they're interested, or because of what they can find on the that's been shared, like these gentlemen here. So super powerful tool, only getting easier to use with time. And I'm really grateful for that. So thank you, guys. I want to ask a question, just a general brainstorming about, um, given the board's capabilities and its Wi-Fi cap connectability and its web camera connectability, when you're daydreaming and thinking of possible educationally related projects, um, what are some of the ideas you have that this might be capable of? Just throwing anything out there. <laughs> I should have warned you about that one, I'm sure. Uh, so right now, what I just said is, what do we want to talk about? We've had quite a few ideas on how to implement the Galileo, anything ranging from implementing it using uh, multiple video screens, trying to get like a Raspberry Pi thing going on, or uh, Another member of ours, Katie, had an idea for a cookie dispenser that somebody across the museum could press a button and then dispense a cookie in our workshop here. So really anything that can be wireless, wirelessly transmitted is in the realm of possibility with the Galileo. So going along uh, those lines, um, the Gal like as it's been mentioned, the Galileo is an excellent tool to uh, start developing web-enabled devices. So uh, one of the, the ideas that we've kind of been going around with is kind of like developing uh, equivalent of Blink for a web-enabled device. So uh, um, you know, like it's the first program that you write or that's already loaded in Arduino in most cases. So um, we would like to Something kind of call that the Hello World. Are you is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a Hello World, but with world. Web capability. Yeah. Yeah, so blink an LED, get a light to flash. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So maybe you uh, you hook it up to the Ethernet, and then you hook up a relay to it, and then uh, it becomes a server. And as soon as you enter the address on on your browser, maybe you click a button, and it turns on your coffee maker or something like that. Um, so kind of like it's a it's a blink kind of or hello world equivalent, but more specific to the web-enabled uh, capabilities that the uh, Galileo has. We haven't done that yet, but that's like something that we. I get excited about this web-enabled business in particular when I'm daydreaming projects. Um, you know what that means. You know, being able to make something blink over the internet also means that you can have you can build something that responds to data. You can build something that responds to temperature in places. You can build something that responds to the tweets or hashtags um, that make something physical happen based on what's going on in the, the web world. Of, you, know, you can make you, so things happen according to your email inbox. Um, you know, that's <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, in conjunction with the motors or driving other things. Uh, to me, that's very exciting because it unlocks this power of information, communication, no matter where you go and no matter what you have with you to communicate. We're all web-enabled in different ways. Um, you now have a very powerful conduit from the web to something physical happening or interactive happening, which is quite exciting to me, actually, educationally. How about you, BK? Any uh, random uh, thoughts about things that you yeah, I mean, I, I, the, With the whole idea of Twitter, um, 
totally my my biggest goal in terms of doing this project is getting Twitter integrated into it because having this big cumbersome website to send messages to things that we make is not not necessarily needed when we have a bunch of people that Twitter accounts and all that that sort of stuff. Um, the thing that I'm most interested in, because uh, I've just been going back to tinkering with proper tape circuitry um, and simple circuits, um, analog circuitry, not not like an Arduino based thing where you're getting something to blank. Um, but actually, like using simple circuits um, and logic, uh, is making a web-enabled tic-tac-toe um, between two <laughs> different. Things. That's like I, I think that would be pretty cool if we could have kids making like little game boards and then having them play through the through like our, our little network at the library across different library branches. Um, I think that would be a really cool project, and I. I have the simple circuits for it. Um, it's just a matter of kind of taking the Galileo and the simple circuits and, and having them talk to each other. Um, that would be, I think, that would be kind of a fun dream project for me to, to tinker with and and do with the kids. I have another web enabled thing I would love to have during our 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 Maker Core or Maker Ed broadcast, such as this, something in the background that responds. To what's going on, or <laughs> like, like a little meter, like thumbs up, thumbs down on something, or number of viewers, or um, um, stop talking, Steve, like that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> seriously, like something that that would happen. The unfortunate fact is that there's a, a lag between what goes on here um, and what people see when it's broadcast that would make it not quite real time. But um, you know, it'd be kind of funny to have that sort of physical feedback of something happening in the background controlled. Um, even just being able to give comments through a speech bot, which I've had friends implement before in the past for different web shows, um, that would be a, an inexpensive, um, very cheap thing to do, I think, through this board with the existing drivers, things like that. You could have actually push a button and have a comment read by a robotic voice, for example, which might be kind of dorky and funny, but um, like kids, adults dig robot voices. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, the next time that we meet for this broadcast uh, will be another session that actually has folks from Intel. They had intended to be on this session with us and at the last minute had to pull out, which is all right. That means they'll be back in force um, on August 6th. We'll also have other members of our Intel Explorer community that have been working on projects and ideas, and they can share more about their experience. But in order to prepare for that, I want to take the last few minutes of this broadcast here because I want to keep it a little on the short side. Um, for the kind of questions that you have um, or, or feedback that you would love to give directly to Intel or people that are using the board um, that have been uh, developing from it, what is it that you're most curious about and what is it you wonder about the most about the board or what is it that you've just noticed? So I want to kind of open up this last little session for all things um, wondering and noticing about the Galileo, especially what you might want to have addressed by the Intel folks when they come back on next time when you, you hopefully will be joining them as well. So they can be prepared. Well, one thing we found for some reason is uh, it starts all the pins high. When you turn on the board, all of our pins were high, uh, which means on uh, to anybody else who doesn't understand pins. But that can create some issues on some implementations if you have everything initially on. Uh, uh, even in the startup phase. Uh, you can, in your code, accommodate for that by having a, a line or two that turns all the pins low, but for that initial startup time, all of them turning high could be an issue. Right. Would that even happen in a microsecond time frame just as a program starts and it boots up before that road code could even run? It, it, it could, but we found uh, the native state was high even after the boot. Uh, I don't know if it was just the board we had or if it was all the boards. I do believe we had two boards at least that did that. Yeah, we co connected a bunch of LEDs to them and, uh, to test it out, and like all of them lit up as soon as we turned the board on. Wow. That seems a little problematic if you're trying to control something finely, like a motor or uh, eventually a stepper motor or something like that. It's when it first you don't want your robot rolling off the table in the first five seconds of booting. So. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, so okay. That sounds like a great one for the Intel folks. Yeah. So this. This could be something that could be definitely adjusted via firmware if it's not already mm -hmm. being worked on. And I'm sure it probably has. I saw some things on the forums. So. Yeah, so that's one of the things, uh, just 
for any new Galileo user, as soon as you get your board, definitely update the firmware and get the newest version of the IDE. It's, it's constantly being uh, improved. The conflict you found with Linux and the IDE. Uh, yeah, you. Did. So one time we updated the firmware, oh. and we had an older version of the IDE, and it didn't work. Yeah, I. It was. I. I can't actually remember exactly what the problem was, but it's like some combination of like using the old firmware, updating the firmware, then like trying to go back to the old firmware, and even different versions of the IDE. There's some kind of incompatibility. Um, right now, I'm using the old version of the IDE, like the first version that was uh, released, I guess, as of this summer. Um, and I tried to update to the new one that I, uh, was compatible with the Galileo 2. Um, and I found out that it just would not work with any firmware version that I tried to push to this uh, Galileo board. Don't know why. So I'm right now using the old version of it. <laughs> That's the story of new technology, isn't it? Like, you want something to work. Just and, yeah, and we completely understand that this is brand new and they're still working out all the kinks. Uh, we're just saying what we found. Yeah. I know. I love that. I, well, I love that this is the process because whenever people use things that just work seamlessly, um, it's nice for them to get this little behind-the-scenes image about what does it take for that to happen. It takes a lot of people going, why isn't this working? Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Hours and hours of time go into your seamless experience. <laughs> so, I so to really on behalf of the world, thank you for that attitude. <laughs> BK, any uh, thoughts and wonderings about the board? Final, final notes. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me, it's uh, it's more about community and sharing what you're working on or sharing the problems that you're having, um, and maybe externalizing it past the the Intel Galileo forums because I know it, the. The, the Galileo forms may be a little cumbersome for, say, educators or people that are totally new to Arduino and the like. Um, so maybe, say, like reaching out if you're part of MakerCore through the, the Google Hangout community or even going on the, the Google Plus uh, community for the Intel Galileo um, and posting there and reaching out to people, I'd say do that. Um, because I know myself, uh, Kenny, who's another guy here in Philadelphia that will be on the next session probably, um, we've kind of banded together and have little study groups. Yeah. So it's more people that are say, interested in um, introducing this thing directly to kids and getting them making on it. Maybe we can do our own little Google Plus Hangouts or something like that um, and talk about what things are out there, just pool resources, all that sort of stuff. Um, I know personally I'm going to be pushing the Willio Drin thing, however you pronounce it. Um, Put it in the comments, can, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I will post that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, no, that's 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 kind of my focus is really just talking to other people, reaching out while we're working on this stuff, just so that we can easily share resources and make them fairly accessible. Uh, so Brandon, uh, I had a question for you because uh, I've also been trying to get really during to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, at first I thought it was uh, an issue with the museum's uh, network. Because well, mm -hmm. first of all, we don't have Ethernet ports in our uh, space here, so I try to do like a bridge connection between my laptop and the Galileo to see if that would work. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't. Uh, and then I also tried. Wi -Fi or uh, it was through Wi-Fi, but I plugged it straight into my Ethernet port and bridged the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet connections. Um, okay. Then it didn't work, but I also took it home. Plugged it in into my home router. Um, well, the I guess the laptop was still done with Wi-Fi and it still didn't work. Uh, is okay. it something that you've experienced, or how have you gotten it to work? So at first, at first I had a few issues with it with connection, um, but I mean I've only I only use one board, so I don't know exactly what I did to it to make it work perfectly. I know I did uninstall it and then update the firmware at one point, um, and I think this has. Uh, one on it doesn't have the seven or whatever it is. Um, I forget. Um, but I have had a good amount of success with Ethernet. I, I don't have a Wi-Fi card, um, so just Ethernet at home at Kenny's place um, at the library. I haven't done it only because um, our, our network there is restricted to you know, sign in with the library card and your pin and all that sort of stuff. And I haven't talked to 
our IT guys on how to how to get around that. Just that. Um, but I, I have had success uploading stuff to it, linking stuff to it, um, pulling up the shell, so talking to Linux uh, via their website. Um, it's just a matter of working with that visual programming language and seeing how far either he can take it or a few of us can take it with him, um, the, the guy that's developing. Um, that's that's where I'm at right now. But I, I have I have had success. I mean, we can totally talk um, and maybe figure out what's going on uh, with viewers because I think it's one of the tools that makes it super accessible, um, but so that our kids can work on it. And the cool thing about it is it works on like say iOS and, and mobile browsers, so you can use a phone which all of our kids have pretty much. They don't necessarily have computers at home, but they have phones. So if they have a phone and we have this guy, they can just keep going back and forth. And like it. Yeah, and that's interesting if you have any issues. I know, I know it's, he's been updating the website a ton lately, so it's like every, every few days you won't be able to upload something just because he's doing something on the back end. It's very much data and very much a work in Cool. Well, I want to give the uh, viewers that we have, because we do have some, uh, a chance to ask questions on either the Q&A app, or I'm also looking at the YouTube comments, so if you have some final questions. But um, while I'm waiting for that lag for you to hear and respond to those uh, last, last questions here, I just want to say, like, the last thing about this board in, in regards to education is that for this to be powerful in education, you need not to be the expert on it. Um, this is something that a child can take on, or a class can take on, and really dive into deeply and become very quickly um, a contributor to the community and an expert on. So it's about having a tool that's powerful that they won't grow out of. This is definitely something you can use at a simpler level as a pure Arduino, or you can use it very deeply as a Linux computer in a sense um, with, with far greater capability. Uh, so it's something that's just, it means potential and possibility. And if I think back to the first computer that got me going on all things technical, it had 1K of RAM. It had less than a megahertz of speed. Of, of speed. And, and yet I was writing programs for it and writing video games, and even in that limited amount of space. So whatever tool you're given, you're, you're, it's, it's, it's a, a beautiful constraint to build upon and help out with others. So do you guys wish you had these when you were little kids? The thing I think is crazy about it is like it's not even just coding something and making a video game and having stuff work on the screen. It's now like, hey, I can make this noise. Like I can I can have something that when someone moves or my cat moves, it makes a crazy yeah. noise. Or stuff like that. Like uh, the, the sky's the limit really at that point. Um, and as long as you have mentors, as long as you have communities to work with and people to 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 tinker with, even your peers, like you can you can really take it anywhere. Yeah. It's extremely empowering to feel part of the community, to know that you're contributing towards the entire world, to know that you as a teen or even a preteen could be developing and, and sharing things about this that have yet to be figured out with adults or coming up with new ideas. So um, I love that about this. It can be a very empowering tool. And this is just representative of a whole bunch of tools that can give you a similar opportunity. It's a matter of getting these into the hands and giving the time and the trust. Um, I like that these are relatively inexpensive enough that you can trust certain students to actually bring them home. If they don't have a computer in a home, if you've got something that's $60 and a little bit of support, um, you can, it's far cheaper than a laptop to check out, for example. You know, um, They can take it to the library and, and hack on it there if they don't have a computer at home, and they can use it there. So that's a, just an idea about how this might be used in an empowering way to help increase access to these digital tools. Uh, and they'll only get far cheaper with time. Next year, we may be talking about the Edison, you know, the uh, newest Intel similar to this, but in a SD card size. Do you guys know about that? Yeah, that's pretty exciting, too. All right, one last check for questions here. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up here at this point, which is nice at a good 45-minute mark. Thank you for putting up with the early uh, technical issues with having nothing but VK space on there. <laughs> so, you were the star for the first 10 minutes of the broadcast before I figure out how to eject a ghost user that was on here that was hogging the, uh, keeping me from doing the screen things. But we will be meeting again August 6th. Thanks you all, thanks you all for joining. 
in the next uh, advertisement for that, um, we'll be able to ask questions in advance that we can address, and we'll have a large, far larger crowd than this. So it'll be an interesting party. And by then, hopefully, the way that these things go, many of the things that you're working on will be solved. You'll be moving on to other things. So thank you, guys. I appreciate this. As soon as we end the podcast, we'll hang out just for a few minutes to debrief. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye, everybody.